Okay. We're taking Dan away from the horse racing. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> oh, I, I think I, I think I'll be talking right when the Cox Plate jumps. So yeah, uh, big day good. of horse racing here in Australia today. So um, what what racing is that? Uh, it's the the, uh, the Cox Plate. It's the uh, the the best weight for age horse race in Australia. Wow. It's a, it's a, a big event. There's uh, probably about a third of the, the field are horses that have come from the United Kingdom just for this race. My goodness, they survived the journey. Yeah. Yeah, they, uh, they, they even, the, the Australian government they even allowed them to come in despite the quarantine. So wow. uh, all, of their, all of their handlers and staff and so... Yeah, it was a bit okay. controversial. Yeah, we're on live stream. Yeah, we're on live. We're live. On that, on that note, um, <laughs> look, welcome everybody. Uh, my name's Steve Nichols. Uh, I am director of cardiology at Monash in Melbourne and director of the Victorian Heart Institute. And behalf of my colleagues at the Asia Pacific uh, Cardiometabolic Consortium and the Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology, I'd like to welcome you today to uh, this webinar where we will be reviewing some of the key studies that were presented at this year's uh, European Society of Cardiology annual scientific meeting. And it was extraordinary with regards to some of the uh, late breaking clinical trials at that meeting and, and the data that they presented. I think there's the potential to have uh, enormous implications for the way that we uh, treat our patients. Uh, we uh, um, are grateful for the support uh, for the National Taiwan University College of Medicine today with regards to the IT support uh, and the Asia Pacific uh, Cardiometabolic Consortium, thank Amgen uh, for, for their support that we've had over the last few years. Um, so um, we will be uh, both live streaming this and it will also be on a YouTube channel. And on, on that note, um, we'll get into that first of our uh, four speakers, uh, Associate Professor K.K. Yeo. Uh, he is a Senior Consultant Cardiologist and Interventional Cardiologist at the National Heart Centre in Singapore. Uh, he co-chairs the Asia Pacific Cardiometabolic Consortium with myself uh, and is the Scientific Lead for the Clinical Sciences and Database Core at the National Heart Research Institute in Singapore. Uh, and he's going to give an update today with regards to the results of the DAPA CKD study. Over to you, K.K. Thanks very much, Steve, and uh, welcome everyone. And uh, it's good to see you guys on the Saturday. So I'm, today I'm going to be uh, reviewing the DAPA CKD study that was uh, shared at the European Society of Cardiology 2020 and also simultaneously published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. So I think we all know that uh, DAPA, glyphoxin and other SGLT2 inhibitors have shown uh, multiple beneficial effects in a variety of studies. Um, in, in, the, in the DAPA uh, drug per se, uh, in the declared TME58, and of course, last year in the DAPA HF study in which uh, patients with or without diabetes show a beneficial, uh, beneficial outcomes with uh, DAPA glyphoxin. And then there's, of course, the Credence study with Canna glyphoxin um, in patients with diabetes and, uh, and renal impairment. And then uh, there are other studies with Emperor Reg, uh, with Emperor that uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Carolyn, will discuss shortly. So um, because of all these studies and, uh, um, that I've shown, um, the, the DAPA CKD study was uh, performed and this was uh, presented by um, Hido Hirspink at the uh, ESC this year. Um, this is the New England publication at the same time. And... Uh, we know that uh, the rationale for, uh, for the DAPA CKD study is based on uh, what uh, the earlier studies that we, we highlighted, and that CKD itself is an important contributor for cardiovascular morbidity and all cause mortality, as well as a poorer quality of life. And the only classes of uh, medication that has been shown to slow the progression of CKD were the ACE inhibitors or ARBs. The role of the SGLT2 inhibitors, as shown in earlier studies such as Credence, and subset studies of uh, um, the, um, um, the TME58 study suggest that they may also have beneficial effects in patients with renal impairment with or without diabetes. And again, we have mentioned the DAPA-HF study, which showed that DAPA-Glyphoxin reduced the risk of worsening heart failure or death from cardiovascular causes independently of the presence of diabetes. So in this particular study, the authors hypothesized that DAPA-Glyphoxin would also preserve kidney function and improve outcomes in patients with CKD 
independently of the presence of diabetes. So the objective, therefore, was to assess whether treatment with DAPA compared to placebo reduced the risk of renal and cardiovascular events in patients with or without, CK, with or without diabetes and who are re already receiving standard of care, including the maximum tolerated doses of ACE inhibitors or ARB. The primary outcome was a composite outcome of sustained more than 50% reduction in the uh, GFR, um, end-stage uh, kidney disease, renal or cardiovascular death. And the secondary outcomes in an hierarchical fashion were composite outcomes of sustained more than or equal to 50% GFR decline, end-stage kidney disease or kidney uh, renal death, followed by cardiovascular death or hospitalizations for heart failure, and lastly, all-cause mortality. This is the study design, and uh, you can see that they included patients you know, on the top left of this screen with a, with a calculated uh, estimated GFR of 25 to 75 mils per minute per 1.73 meter square. This is less than the, uh, the Dikimi, uh, uh, than the uh, Credence study. Um, and in this case, there was a urine uh, albumin to creatinine ratio of between 200 to 5,000 milligram per gram. Um, and the, the patients had to have a stable maximum tolerated ACE or ARB dose for at least four weeks. And these uh, on the right side of the screen at the top were the key exclusion criteria, type 1 diabetes, polycystic kidney disease, lupus, nephritis, anchor associated vasculitis, and patients who were on immunosuppressive therapy for at least the prior six months. The randomization and the subsequent flow of the study is shown at the bottom. Uh, patients upon a randomization uh, were given um, DAPA glyphoxin and uh, follow up to the study to the to the study closure uh, time point. And um, the outcome analysis was based on the Cox proportional hazard model, stratified by two things: one, the presence of diabetes, and two, the uh, uh, the urine uh, creatinine ratio. I think the uh, well, the threshold was a thousand. So the study involved uh, 21 countries across 26 sites with more than 4,000 uh, participants. You can see a good distribution. The, the China uh, cohort, I think I wrote uh, a bit later due to regulatory hurdles. I think it was only in early 2019. But nonetheless, there's a good spread of uh, uh, patients of different ethnic groups, which you will see in the results shortly. Uh, this is the study timeline. The first patient entered the trial in February 2017. And uh, the the independent uh, uh, outcomes uh, data monitoring committee recommended uh, in March 2020 that this trial be stopped due to overwhelming efficacy based on 408 uh, primary endpoint events, which was 60% of the expected number of events, um, and the study was then uh, stopped. Um, this is the patient the flow chart. So you can see that uh, of the 7,500 5, 7, patients who were enrolled, um, only 4,300 were randomized after various uh, criteria were, were taken into consideration. Uh, and the distribution is uh, e equal on both sides. And the flow shows that 99.5% of the patients on the, on the DAPA arm uh, completed the study, while 99.8, almost all the patients completed the study on the placebo arm. Uh, this is the baseline. Uh, these are the baseline characteristics. And as mentioned, um, there was a good representation across different ethnic groups with 35% uh, 35 patient, 35 of uh, patients on DAPA um, uh, from Asia uh, or Asian ethnicity, which, uh, which I guess uh, in, in the context of the Asian Pacific Cardiometabolic Consortium is uh, highly relevant. And you can see the presence of diabetes was approximately two-thirds in both arms and the, uh, the median uh, urine uh, albumin credit creatinine ratio was approximately uh, 960, 900 about uh, on both sides. ACE and ARB usage was very high at uh, 97% uh, on both arms. And these are the primary outcomes. Um, you can see that there is, uh, the primary outcome is, uh, is, uh, shows a uh, superiority in the um, DAPA glyphoxin arm with a number to treat of 19, a hazard ratio of 0 0.61 with a very comfortable uh, uh, confidence interval. And I think this is a, a, a very a good result for the use of this drug in these patients. These are the, this is the flow chart, or rather the graph for the secondary outcome, which of uh, sustained more than 50% uh, GFR decline, end-stage kidney disease, ren or renal death. And uh, again, the hazard ratio is 0 0.56 with a very com comfortable confidence interval um, uh, as shown on the screen. 
For cr chronic kidney, uh, chronic dialysis, kidney transplantation, and renal death, again, a hazard ratio of 0 0.66 with a, a, a statistically significant p-value. For the primary uh, outcome and its components, um, you can see that uh, all the uh, components are met except for cardiovascular death, which uh, did cross the line of unity, but again, uh, you know, in, uh, in favor of cardiovascular death. Uh, these are the, some of the pre-specified subgroup analysis with or without uh, diabetes. Um, uh, the, the drug sh shows uh, beneficial effects. And uh, regardless of the thresholds of the urine albumin creatinine ratio of a using a threshold of 1,000, again, uh, beneficial effects. And looking at the estimated GFR of less than 45 or more than or equal to 45, also beneficial effects. Note that the threshold is uh, up to 25 uh, mils per minute per 1.73 meters square. Um, the primary outcome, uh, according to other pre-specified outgroups by age, gender, uh, race, um, region, uh, diabetes, um, and the blood pressure were all favorable, with just one tiny exception of uh, the region of Asia, even though the direction is clearly in favor of Asia, it did hit uh, 1.0 uh, in terms of the uh, the, the confidence intervals. Secondary outcomes of a cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization, you can see that again the hazard ratio is in favor of dapagliflozin. All cause mortality again uh, in favor with a hazard ratio of uh, 0 0.69, and I think this is a, a certainly a very important uh, outcome. Now, this is interesting, and this is not from the uh, slide deck presentation, which I had just uh, shown. This is from the paper itself. Um, there is an uh, interesting change in the, uh, from the baseline of the uh, estimated GFR. You can see there's an initial uh, sharper drop in the uh, change in the GFR, but uh, about uh, 12 months from the randomization uh, between the DAPA group and the placebo group, the lines cross and the rate of deterioration is, uh, is uh, flatter in the DAPA group, which suggests that the drug does help prevent uh, the, the pace of uh, renal function deterioration. Uh, in terms of safety, uh, really no signal in terms of adverse outcomes. Uh, the safety events are, are ones which have been published in this, the, this particular class of drugs. And if you look at a study, this discontinuation of study drug, discontinuation due to any adverse event, any serious ever adverse events and adverse events of interest such as amputation, DKA, fracture, uh, major hypoglycemia, volume depletion, etc. Again, none of them were statistically significant across the two arms. So in conclusion for the DAPA CKD study, in patients with CKD with or without type 2 diabetes, DAPA glyphloxin compared to placebo reduced the risk of kidney failure reduce the risk of death from cardiovascular causes or hospitalization for heart failure and prolonged survival. And the drug was well tolerated in keeping with its established safety profile. So what, what I think we have learned from this study and in the context of RD, such as uh, declared TIMI 58, um, DAPA-HF, the CBD real studies, is that uh, dapagliflozin improves outcomes in diabetic patients, in heart failure patients with or without diabetes, in CKD patients in CKD class two to four with or without diabetes. This is really quite an impressive study and an impressive series of studies because you know, many of our patients have all these three conditions. Um, they come in with a heart failure and they have uh, you know, borderline or poor renal function and they're often diabetic. And, uh, would be wonderful if we had a drug that improved outcomes uh, across this entire continuum of studies. Um, to put things into perspective, we use ACE inhibitors and ARBs in heart failure patients, in CKD patients, uh, but they are not used as standard therapy in diabetic patients unless they also have concomitant hypertension or heart failure or CKD. So, I would say that this is, uh, this is really uh, perhaps a game changer in our armamentarium against our most complex patients. Now, what is the cost effectiveness? Now, I, I'm just flashing these slides out because clearly with the initial DAPA studies uh, from 2018, 2019, and now 2020, there have been various studies that have looked at the use of DAPA-glyphoxin in the treatment of diabetes in terms of cost effectiveness. 
In the study on the left, this was, I think, out of Australia and the study on the right out of uh, China. Um, one study said it was cost effective, the other said it was not. But looking at perhaps uh, just the heart failure cohort out of the DAPA HF study, uh, from the, um, from the DAPA HF uh, cohort, uh, this study, which look at cost effectiveness uh, at uh, various countries in the health economic uh, analysis, um, the authors were able to show that DAPA glyphloxin is likely to be a cost effective treatment for heart failure with reduced e ejection fraction in the UK, German, and Spanish healthcare systems. You will see, of course, some of the, um, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio as shown in the in where my mouse uh, cursor is uh, at the values as shown, which is of course um, um, something to bear in mind when we look at the drug, which now has uh, additional benefits in patients with CKD. Um, in this uh, study out of Australia, um, I I couldn't get the PDF um, unfortunately. Um, this was in the from the Australian healthcare perspective, it was also seen to be cost effective. Now. Um, this just came out last night, and I remembered I was uh, I was literally in bed um, clearing my emails, and this came through. and and uh, And I'm sure uh, Carolyn will talk about it shortly about the Emperor Reduce trial. But again, um, this in patients with uh, in the Emperor Reduce study, Emperor had a, a beneficial effect in patients with uh, in preventing the rate of renal decline, renal function decline in patients with or without CKD, and regardless of the severity of kidney impairment and baseline. So this is uh, certainly something that is very promising as a treatment option for our patients. Um, what do I think about this? Should it be the first line treatment in our diabetic patients? Should it be the first line treatment in our heart failure patients? Should it be the first line treatment in our renal impairment patients given it is broad range of beneficial effects with all cause mortality benefits? I think this is something that the uh, uh, payers uh, and governments will need to think carefully about and certainly professional societies as well. Um, I think we now know that uh, this class of drugs can be extended to CKD class four and that uh, I would say that uh, especially in uh, cardiac patients, preventing renal failure is really quite a big deal. And I see, um, I see this as being a, a, an important step. Um, do we know whether it has similar effects with other SGLT2 inhibitors? I think Caroline will talk a little bit more about this, but we of, of course have seen from um, the last two slides um, earlier on that uh, in, in, the, in the subgroup analysis for renal impairment, it does appear to show similar benefits with ampergliflocin. Um, and I think that would be, uh, you know, there'll be more studies coming out uh, in, in, the, in the next one or two years. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your kind attention and uh, you know, maybe we can discuss a bit more about that. Thank you. Thanks, KK. Uh, excellent summary of uh, DAPA CKD. Um, and I guess just to take you up on one of your kind of points towards the end about really extending the data into stage four kind of renal failure, I think there's still, you know, in clinical practice remains uh, a hesitancy to want to start these agents, you know, in people with you know, EGFRs in the 30s. And, and in fact, I can tell you when my own country, um, we're not technically allowed to start these agents at an EGFR less than 45. Um, do you think this data really allows us now to move the goalposts and say, look, we can safely and effectively use these agents, you know, certainly down to an EGFR 25? Yeah, so... I mean, based on the on on at least the DAPA CKD study, it would seem to suggest that it is possible. Um, can I ask? Um, in do you think that the DAPA CKD would allow the Australian uh, regulation regulatory bodies to to do that, or you think more data is required? Well, I think it's going to be pretty compelling data um, when they look at that, and I think that. Um, I think the argument about expanding the indication outside of diabetes is a separate question. And I think that's something that our, our regulators will, will certainly look at hopefully quickly, but they probably won't take as, um, they probably take longer than we would like them to do for that. Um, but, but in parallel, I think we do have this question around, um, 
degree of comfort in starting the agents, you know, in, in the setting of some degree of renal dysfunction, I think that this result will, will help a lot, um, I think. And, and certainly more clinical trial data, and we'll see a little bit more in that space in the next talk, um, can only help, I think. I have a quick question for everyone, and that is, how do we make sense of cost effectiveness when a drug has different effects across different groups of patients? Um, you know, I look at my, my you know, I, I'm covering the coronary care unit this week, and um, I have lots of patients who have come in for heart failure, they're diabetic, and their creatinine is really not the best as CKD class 3 or class 4, and if I were to do a cost effectiveness study, I really don't have a good comparator that, that has proven mortality benefits or major comorbidity benefits across three domains. I wonder how can one calculate cost effectiveness in such a setting? I, I, I'm just curious more than anything else. I, I, I was toying with playing around the idea in my mind and I struggle a little bit with it. I, I don't know what do the others think. Carolyn? So I'm definitely no expert in cost effectiveness analysis. And I was just kind of nodding and smiling because that's a very good question. And I know that sounds like a cop out, but it's not. It, it just literally is a very good question. And I think it really brings to mind that we, we now need to think about integrated care for our patients. And um, I think there are a couple of efforts and, and very prominent examples um, in the United States, for example, where combined cardio-renal metabolic clinics have been formed. And perhaps it's from data, you know, clinical data from that, that you can gain. Um, we always need data to do the projection, right? And to see whether it's value-based, um, uh, uh, delivery of value-based healthcare. So I, I'm hoping that, that such analysis will be possible. I think, I think one of the challenges with health economic kind of analysis, your first step, you've, a number of these kind of, um, a number of these analyses are done not without necessarily having the totality of the data um, from the clinical trial. Um, and then importantly, acknowledging that clinical trials often are a somewhat selected group of patients compared to what healthcare systems do. And then, so you've then got to extrapolate um, the findings from what are relatively clean studies into what are quite dirty health systems uh, in terms of patients don't always fit clear definitions. And, and so I, I think it becomes complicated. And I think, you know, the sense of continuing to review cost effectiveness, you know, should be something that we should be aiming to do just like we do from a safety perspective when we put drugs out to clinical practice. KK, can I ask you, um, you know, one of the challenges, I guess, when, when you look at data like that, which is so good, um, it's almost hard to know what to actually ask. Um, um, so the, the one thing that comes up in the subgroup analyses, which, you know, putting the caveat around over interpreting any of that, but there is, a, there is an interaction p-value that's statistically significant for uh, baseline blood pressure and that the magnitude of benefit appeared to be better in the people who had a systolic blood pressure less than 130 at baseline compared to um, patients with higher blood pressure where they still derived a benefit, but perhaps less, you know, can we overinterpret that? Or is there something to think about why somebody might do better um, with a better blood pressure coming in? Yeah, so I, I saw that um, and I'm not sure what to make of it. Um, both, um, bars were well within the, 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 how do you call it, the, in favor of uh, DAPA. Uh, but the group of uh, patients with a systolic blood pressure of less than 130 was uh, about half the size of that of patients with more than uh, 130 millimeters mercury. Um, and therefore, the confidence interval for that is broader. The second point I wanted to make was that it could be that these patients had other unmeasured factors that allowed them to have better blood pressure. And I wonder whether that could be a reason why um, this they derive a greater benefit. But honestly, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, uh, and um, I wonder whether there's any further interaction between blood pressure and estimated GFR. 
um, or blood pressure um, and, and say ejection fraction as a surrogate of a pump function in, in, in these patients. So I, I, I must say, I, I, I see that particular one as well. But for now, my takeaway is that it may not make a huge difference uh, what the blood pressure is at baseline. It would help both patients. And maybe one other way to think about it is the, the, perhaps a hypothesis that if you start off with a higher blood pressure, the blood pressure lowering effect of DEPA, even though small, may have contributed to the outcomes, but this would suggest that it is more than that. Um, so, so those are my thoughts on, on, on those lines. I think the one reason why we may have difficulty making sense of some of these subgroup analysis, other than the fact that they are subgroup analysis, has to do with the fact that the exact mechanism by which DEPA glyphoxin uh, benefits patients with CKD uh, remains uh, unclear. It, of course, there are hypotheses from you know, anti-inflammatory effects and whatnot, but, but I, I don't know whether, there's, uh, whether the, um, the reasons are as well understood as we would like, uh, we, as we would like. I, and maybe that's the reason why we can't answer some of these questions. Yeah, I agree. I think the mechanistic studies that are ongoing will help in that space. And I think we'll see more analyses in terms of blood pressure. So on that note, thank you, KK. And we'll move on to the next um, presentation will be by Professor Carolyn Lamb. Uh, Carolyn is a senior uh, uh, consultant cardiologist at the National Heart Centre in Singapore. She's also director of the Women's Heart uh, Health uh, Program there and has an active uh, interest in a whole range of activities, both in the heart failure and digital health arena. Uh, and Carolyn is going to uh, update us on the Emperor Reduced findings. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, well, Professor Yeo has really set the stage very, very well for me to launch straight into talking about Emperor Reduced. So what was this trial about? It was a global, huge phase three, typical RCT, this time looking at the SGLT2 inhibitor empagliflozin compared to placebo on top of guideline-directed medical therapies for HEF-REF in patients with chronic symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, regardless of diabetes. I'll say that again. Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, regardless of diabetes. So that part is really important. The design is really simple and elegant, if I may. Empagliflozin at a single daily dose versus placebo with these endpoints. The primary composite was time to first cardiovascular death or or heart failure hospitalization. The secondary endpoints were first and recurrent heart failure hospitalization. And very interestingly for a HEFREF trial, EGF, uh, EGFR slope, so a renal outcome. Now let's just quickly go through the trial inclusion and exclusion criteria. These were adults, as I said, with chronic symptomatic HEFREF who also had elevated NT pro BNP. So these were high risk patients. You can see those strata of NT pro BNP criteria that varied according to ejection fraction. The exclusion criteria are as you may expect. What I really want to point out is you couldn't have a systolic blood pressure less than 100 and you couldn't have a GFR less than 20. So 20 was the EGFR exclusion cutoff for Emperor. Now, I want to just right away go through the baseline characteristics compared to the recent groundbreaking HEFREF trials, right? Because it's been such a year of bonanza uh, um, treatments in HEFREF. So first, look that the age is very similar to DAPA-HF, to Victoria, which was also a positive trial that was reported this year of Verisigwat compared to placebo and HEFREF. And of course, Paradigm, the classic literally paradigm shifting trial of ARNI compared to ACE in HEFREF. If you look at ejection fraction, slightly lower with Emperor Reduced. And if you look at NT pro BNP, notice that it is slightly higher than DAPA HF, but not as high as in Victoria, where Victoria exclusively enrolled patients within six months of a worsening event, which was either a heart failure hospitalization or IV diuretic requirement. So Victoria was particularly an ill population. 
Now, despite having lower EF, a little bit higher anti-proBNP than DAPA, notice that a, a bit higher proportion were uh, New York Heart Association class two, so they seem a bit less symptomatic. Uh, GFR mean was 62, a little bit higher proportion had a lower uh, GFR less than 60 compared to DAPA HF. And then very importantly, this trial had a higher proportion of use of ARNI and a very high proportion of use of guideline directed medical therapy, the triple ACE ARB, beta blocker, and MRA. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to remember everything I said. No, I'm kidding, because we're going to get back to it. It has implications for the results that we're going to see. Now, again, going over the endpoints. These are the three pre specified endpoints for hierarchical testing. I've gone through them before, but now I'm going to show you the results one by one. First, the primary endpoint, the composite of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization was robustly reached with a relative risk reduction of 25%. That is an absolute risk reduction of 5.2% and a number needed to treat of only 19 now, if we look at the second hierarchical endpoint, that was total heart failure hospitalization, so first and recurrent, also met with a relative risk reduction of 30%. And finally, that third hierarchical endpoint, EGFR slope. Now you'd be already familiar with these graphs because Professor Yeo already showed you the same thing in DAPA CKD, but this was also met, and you can see empagliflozin really help flatten the slope. In other words, help to prevent long-term renal decline in a significant fashion as well. And so it reached all three pre-specified um, endpoints. I mean, should we just stop here? Uh, I don't think so. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Let's look at some exploratory endpoints. So the first, very impressively, was the composite renal endpoint. And here, you're seeing this consistent message with the SGLT2 inhibitors, so impressive, a 50% reduction. I mean, that's, that's, that's really amazing to me. Um, quality of life, the other thing that's really important to our patients with HEFREF, was also improved with empagliflozin. Now, if we look at the components of that um, primary composite endpoint, uh, it, of course, that's the repetition of the composite right on the top with a 0.75 hazard ratio. However, you can see that it is really predominantly driven by the first heart failure hospitalization. And for cardiovascular death, the hazard ratio was 0.92 and the confidence interval crossed one. So in other words, um, although this is exploratory, and the authors argue in that sense, we don't put a p-value to it, you understand that if it crosses one, it means it'll be non-significant. Now, let's you know, really, really get the totality of the evidence here by considering now the adverse events as well. Now, very important, this slide, is that it was extremely well tolerated. Um, if you look at the presence of any serious adverse events or even any adverse events is completely comparable to the placebo group. Even if we look at things that are uh, key interest in the management of HEFREF, like volume depletion or hypotension, very comparable. And ketoacidosis, we worry about it. As cardiologists, simply because we're scared that we don't know how to recognize it, well, guess what? There were no cases, no cases in the EMPA-treated arm of emperor reduced. And then if we look at things like hypoglycemia, uh, very, very gratefully, if you look at even patients without diabetes, this was exceedingly rare to have any hypoglycemia. Now, what was common? Indeed, genital tract infections. Um, uh, however, look what common means. Um, it is higher then in the placebo group, but the absolute numbers and percentages 
are still very low. Okay, and now in the next uh, few minutes that I have, I want to put all these results in context. So here now are all the outcomes and I put DAPHF paradigm even shift, which was of Ivabradine and HEFREP and emphasis, you know, the, the kind of classic MRA trial. What I want everyone to notice is that for the primary composite, it was really comparable. And this is in spite of the fact that the background therapy was better than you could expect. For example, more than 70% of these patients were already on an MRA, right? So that already says it's so different from something like emphasis, which actually randomized patients to MRA or not. Now, if you look at the heart failure hospitalizations, a very, very robust and consistent reduction, but the cardiovascular death is where there are some differences. It was significantly reduced in DAPA-HF and in Paradigm and in Emphasis, but not in Emperor Reduced or in Shift. Thankfully, there was also very, very consistent improvement in quality of life. But let's just face the elephant in the room of why? Why was there no reduction in cardiovascular mortality in Emperor Reduced versus DAPA-HF? Well, I think that it is a numbers game. I, I think that basically Emperor Reduced was probably underpowered to show the benefit for cardiovascular mortality. Now that may seem really strange because you know I've said before that when we compare the baseline characteristics, they seem sicker than the DAPA-HF group in many ways. However, Notice that although the cardiovascular death rate was similar in both trials, the actual number of cardiovascular deaths was smaller in Emperor Reduce than DAPA-HF. How? Well, first of all, it was a thousand patients smaller as a trial, and the follow-up was 16 versus 18 months, so a shorter follow-up. So the inclusion exclusion criteria in EMPRA somehow selected for patients more prone to heart failure hospitalizations with the composite accumulating very quickly, all right? And the number of actual cardiovascular deaths being smaller. It could also be uh, because there was more use of ARNI and devices in EMPRA Reduce. So that, that could be a reason. Um, it also, of course, could be a difference in the drugs and here we're reminded that the, the corollary in the cardiovascular outcomes trials in type 2 diabetes, well, we've got Empareg that did show a significant impact on cardiovascular death, whereas uh, Declare did not. Now, those populations were also different, but what, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, there are differences, but in the totality of the evidence, I'm not sure it, it really points to heterogeneous effects, and it could be a play of chance. And this is why I want to end with these important take-home messages. In a meta-analysis that was incredibly quickly uh, um, uh, published of EMPRA, and DAPA-HF, there was consistent reduction in all-cause mortality, cardiovascular death, and that primary outcome. Robust, consistent, no evidence of heterogeneity. Remember, it's an important reduction. No matter how you look at it, these are absolute risk reductions that, that translate to a number needed to treat of only 19. So very important to keep that in mind, even as we may want to nitpick about the, the, the components. Another very important thing is the consistency of the renal benefits. And we've heard a lot about it. I don't need to, to emphasize more. And the consistency in patients with and without diabetes. With EMPRA, you see the significance is SGLT2 inhibitors now become a HEF-REF drug. From a diabetes drug, forget that, it's a HEF-REF drug. And with two drugs now, 
we are inching towards a class effect. Although I don't think that's what the guidelines are going to say. I think it, it's probably going to be like the beta blockers that we've got evidence-based SGLT2 inhibitors, but it, it's really significant that the results are so consistent. And it's also very important that these benefits in both trials were seen on top of ARNI. Emperor reduced had a larger proportion of patients on ARNI, so this really provided power to look at this properly. Now, a very interesting little nugget that I hope you won't ask me more about, uh, Steve, because I don't have the answers yet, but notice there was heterogeneity in one subgroup, and that was Asians appear to benefit more than other ethnicities. And, and that the, there was um, uh, evidence of, of subgroup interaction in the individual trials and in this meta-analysis. So hang on to this space. Now, it's not that uh, whites and, and, and other ethnicities don't benefit, you can see, but it, it does seem that there is more benefit in Black and Asian patients. Now, let's also put the adverse effects in context and although we worry about diabetic ketoacid doses and scary stuff like Fournier's gangrene, notice how exceedingly rare these are. We have to be aware, we have to you know, warn patients, take precautions like the sick day rules, but um, I, I, I really don't think um, uh, that should prevent us from, from using it. Um, genital infections are common, but remember, uh, many uh, can be addressed by preventive measures of perennial hygiene, and a lot of them could actually be treated through in, with, with only topical agents or a single oral uh, therapy. So again, uh, uh, not a showstopper. Also bear in mind that these medications are unique in being exceedingly easy to administer. Once daily dosing, single dose, no titration. In fact, if we look at it in combination with all our available HFF therapies, it's kind of the only one. That's, that's really amazing. So if I may summarize now, all this has happened so fast in our heart failure world. And this literally, we just published, uh, Javad Butler and I, and um, we, we, we felt as, as heart failure physicians, we, we really need some kind of simplification of how to go about this. Our traditional model of kind of going in a linear fashion of ACE, up titrate first, then beta blockers, up titrate first, then consider switching to ARNI and so on, it's broken because the trials are coming so fast and furious, the trials itself did not layer um, uh, medications one on the other. For example, Victoria didn't layer on top of SGLT2 inhibitors. And of course, the SGLT2 inhibitor trials did not include anyone with very sick what. So we can't, we can't keep doing this layering approach. It is absolutely not sustainable. So let's flatten it and let's be very practical in, in, in meeting the patient. I consider there are five pathways now that have been shown to improve outcome survival. And that is, you know, it, it, that they are mutually different me mechanisms, right? So either blocking androtensin 2, blocking norepinephrine, blocking aldosterone, blo blocking nepolysin, or blocking SGLT2. And these five pathways can be addressed by four drugs, ARNI, beta blockers, MRAs, and SGLT2 inhibitors. And so I think it's a simplified approach to, to make the attempt to get every patient with HEF-REF on all four of these drugs as much as possible. Bearing in mind, of course, cost that we talked about before, patient preference, adverse events, um, um, things like, like, of course, contraindications and so on, but it just helps to simplify that there are these four, that's the target. And then there are three others to consider in special selected populations. And so I hope to just leave with that message of five pathways, four drugs, three others to consider. Let's just really start implementing this good science now. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. It's an uh, outstanding uh, overview and, and uh, it's always a fantastic talk when you basically start picking off the moderator's questions one by one towards the end of your talk. So I uh, thank you for that. Um, 
Uh, and, I, and I think that where you finished, I think, is is now really the where the real questions lie in 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 this concept of four drugs. Uh, how do we how do we implement that? Is that all at once, or are we still playing a staggered approach? What's your sense? Um, let's just let's just put cost to the side for a minute. Um, in an ideal world how would you see us rolling out those four classes of drugs for, for patients? Thanks for that question. So if I may, um, along with some co-authors, we're writing about a heart failure spending approach. And, and, and that's the concept. Let, let me explain. See the patient as coming in with reserve accounts of blood pressure, heart rate, potassium, renal function, out of out of pocket costs, money itself, and sort of a tolerance of the complexity of the regimen. So they've, they've got these reserve accounts. And it's my duty as a heart failure physician to help them spend from this to get maximum return of investment, if I may. And, and that return of investment is, of course, at um, uh, mortality, morbidity, and even quality of life. Mm. So what I don't want to do is to overspend from one account like blood pressure by using it all up, by up titrating to the highest doses of ACE inhibitors and then depriving and, and, and sort of not even touching the other reserve accounts and depriving the patient of, for example, um, um, something else that could lower blood pressure like SGLT2 inhibitors or, or their Siguat and so on. So what, what we try to do then is also not underspend, but to maximize that spending from each of them. And so if, if we look at SGLT2 inhibitors, um, one thing you may uh, consider is, is blood pressure a little bit, but they're, they're exceedingly, they kind of don't spend from the reserves. And that's why it makes it so easy to give. How I would approach a patient right now is I, I usually start with the ACE and beta blockers because that's what the guidelines kind of say. But if I can go directly to the Arnie's, I, I mean, frankly, if I had HEFREF, I would want to go directly to the Arnie's. Why, why muck around with the ACE first and then switch and have the off period and so on. So Arnie beta blocker, once they're, they're more or less there, I think the MRAs and the SGLT2 inhibitors can be added at the same time. Um, what you want is, is uh, monitor blood pressure, renal function. So almost to answer your question directly, almost at the same time, but not literally in the same prescription. It's like, do it small doses together as tolerated rather than sequentially wasting three weeks for up titration before starting the next four months later, then start the next, not that way, but small doses together of the four. Okay, well, I think that's an excellent uh, appraisal of, of, of the trial and really beyond. Uh, and thanks so much for, for that, Carolyn. I'm going to let you off the hook for now um, and move on to our next speaker, um, uh, Professor Yunya Ako from Kitasato University in Japan, where he is Professor of Cardiovascular Medicine. Uh, he is Director of the Department of Cardiology and Interventional Cardiologist. And we have asked Junya uh, to uh, review the results of the Explorer HCM study, which uh, really explores a very novel kind of therapeutic in a, in a very different uh, clinical scenario than what we're typically used to looking at in um, large RCT. So over to you, Junya. Okay. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, can you see the slide? Uh, so... I have nothing to disclose. So uh, I'll start this uh, uh, Explorer HCM. So uh, it was presented at the uh, ESC Congress 2020 uh, by Dr. Olivotto uh, for all of his uh, uh, the slides. So uh, as you know, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a myocardial disorder characterized by primary left ventricle uh, hypertrophy. And symptoms are often related to dynamic outflow obstruction. 
and current medical management for obstruction, uh, obstructive HCM includes beta blockers, non detopedin calcium channel blockers, or disopyramide. Um, and um, those drugs do not do the pathophysiology of the HCM cell, and those are only, uh, only alleviate uh, the symptoms. So the development uh, effective pharmacological therapy for obstructing HCM is an important unmet clinical need. So hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy as associated with sarcomere mutations may, uh, sorry, uh, uh, may result in excessive number of actin myosin cross bridges, as shown here, leading to hypercontractility and hypertrophy. And these pathophysiologic changes are effectively countered by Mavicamtan, uh, a small molecule inhibitor specific to cardiac myosin that reduces excessive myosin acting cross bridging. And it was developed to be selective for cardiac rather than skeletal muscle function. And preclinical and phase one studies have supported cardio selectivity and no detected impact on skeletal muscle function. So this is a phase two trial, uh, which is called Maverick HCM. And in this phase two trial, 59 non-obstructive HCM patients were randomized uh, one to one-to-one -to -one fashion and target levels of 200 and 500 uh, nanogram per milliliter uh, or placebo. And in this trial, as you can see here, there was a significant reduction in anti-proBNP and cardiac troponin I uh, in this uh, non-obstructive HCM patients. So this uh, uh, brings us to the Explorer uh, HCM trial. Uh, so this tr uh, trial is uh, phase three uh, randomized uh, blind placebo control trial uh, to assess the efficacy and safety of Mavicamtem uh, for target medical treatment of obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And anyway, HA uh, functional class two to three HCM patients are uh, recruited from uh, 68 institutions uh, of 13 countries. So uh, these are the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, so major inclusion uh, criteria includes uh, obstructive HCM and maximum every wall thickness uh, greater or equal to uh, 15 millimeter or uh, it could either be uh, greater or equal to 13 if uh, it's a familial HCM. And peak LVOT gradient at least 50 milligram at, at rest after valsalva maneuver or exercise. And LVEF uh, greater or equal to 55. A major exclusion criteria is also shown here uh, in the uh, history of syncope or uh, uh, SVT within six months. And atrial fibrillation uh, was excluded if it's uh, proximal or intermittent. And patients are also uh, excluded uh, on disopyramide for safety reason. So trial design is shown here. And patients were randomly assigned to once daily Mavicantem or placebo. And for Mavicantem group, uh, individualized doses of 2.5, 5, or 10, or uh, 15 milligram were ultimately administered to achieve target reduction in LVOT gradient less than 30 milligram and the Mavicantem plasma concentration between 350 nanogram and 700 nanogram per milliliter. And those, those titration was done at eight weeks and 14 weeks uh, after the uh, starting the drug. So endpoints are shown here. Primary comp, uh, endpoint is rather an interesting one. It can be either uh, the increase of uh, PVO2 of 1.5 and a reduction of NYHA uh, functional class, or uh, composite two is shown here. It's a, a more than uh, 
or equal to 3.0 uh, increase in peak, peak uh, VO2 and no worsening in animatory uh, functional class, classification. So that means uh, it can be either uh, subjective and uh, objective uh, finding. And secondary endpoints are shown here, uh, post-exercise LVOT gradient and peak video etc. et cetera, as shown here. And the uh, KCCQ uh, questionnaire. And from now, uh, I'll expand the results. So uh, patients were uh, finally 251 patients uh, were randomized either to Mavicantin group or placebo. And this was well tolerated the drug and study com uh, completed uh, patients at 119 in the Mavicantin group and 125 for placebo group. Baseline characteristics are shown here. Uh, so uh, age, about 58. And uh, many patients were uh, on beta blockers, uh, 76%. 75% were uh, on beta blocker. And calcium channel blocker was uh, uh, given in 20 uh, or 13% uh, percent of the patients. Echocardiographic uh, parameters are shown here. LVEF, about 74, uh, 75 and uh, LVOT gradient uh, was 52 uh, for Mavicantin group and 51 uh, for placebo groups. So this is well, uh, it's, uh, as shown here, functional NLHA functional class uh, two was 80, uh, more than 90%, and pro BNP uh, 700, LVEF 75, LVOT gradient uh, 52. So this is, is the uh, important results. So primary and secondary endpoints are shown here. And primary endpoint uh, is a 1.5 milligram increase in peak VO2 or uh, and uh, NYC class improvement or a 3.0 increase in peak VO2. And it was uh, a significantly larger portion of the patients in Mavicantin group met the primary endpoint as compared with placebo group. And both uh, in uh, 3.0 uh, milliliter per kilogram per minute uh, increase in peak VO2 and uh, one uh, energy class improvement was uh, seen in 20% in Mavicantin group as compared with 8% in placebo. And secondary endpoints are shown here. And post-exercise LVLT gradient change uh, was uh, 47, minus 47 uh, milligram per uh, millimeter mercury in Mavicantin group as compared with 10 in placebo group. So these are the graphs of uh, change in LVLT uh, and LVEF. LVEF is on the upper left hand. Uh, there was a slight uh, decrease in LVEF in Mavicantin group from 74 to 70 in uh, Mavicantin group. And resting LVOT uh, pressure gradient is shown here. It was uh, 50 at the time of study, uh, at the beginning of the study, uh, decreased to 14 in Mavicantin group. And vast of LVOT is shown here. Uh, 74 uh, at the beginning of the trial. Uh, it was uh, 24 uh, at the end of the trial. Biomarkers are shown here. anti pro BNP uh, decreased from 777 to uh, 163. And uh, there was also decrease in cardiac troponin I uh, in Mavicantin group. So uh, this graph shows uh, NYHA functional class in Mavicantin group, uh, which is shown on the left-hand side. Uh, so at the end of the trial uh, in Mavicantin group, about half of the patients were functional uh, class one as compared with 21 in placebo uh, group. And Another uh, key exploratory efficacy endpoints are shown here, and, and the trial groups show that complete response are defined as NYHA class one and all LVOT gradient less than 30 milligram mercury. It was achieved 27% uh, 
of the patient in mavacantin group as compared with uh, 0 0.8 in placebo. And the difference was statistically uh, significant. In subgroup analysis, uh, there's, however, an interesting finding uh, at the use of uh, beta blocker. There, uh, the uh, uh, mavacantin worked very well across uh, many uh, subgroups across the board, uh, age and sex and body uh, mass index, LV, EF at the base, uh, baseline. However, there's a slight difference in uh, the use of beta blocker at the uh, baseline. And the uh, mavacantin uh, fares uh, better in patients uh, without the use uh, of beta blocker. Adverse events are shown here, and the mavacantin showed favorable uh, safety profile. It was well uh, tolerated, and serious adverse events were uh, uh, shown. Uh, found in eight percent as compared to the uh, nine percent in placebo and the uh, no uh, significant finding uh, shown here. And the, uh, this slide showed protocol-driven temporary discontinuations in Mavicantin group. So temporary discontinuation for LVEF less than 50 occurred in five patients in the treatment period, three on Mavicantin and two on placebo. And for additional patients, Mavacantin had LVEF uh, less than 50 at week 30. And LVEF recovered to baseline in three patients by the end of eight week washout. And the fourth patient experienced procedural uh, complications and severe LVEF dropped following an ablation for atrial fibrillation during the follow up uh, washout period. And temporary discontinuation for changes in QTC occurred in six patients three on um, Mavacantin and three in placebo. So uh, future direction and the uh, ongoing studies of Mavacantin is shown here in the VALO uh, HCM, uh, which is a Mavacantin as an alternative to septal reduction therapy. This is versus septal ablation or a myectomy. And there's also a long-term follow-up for uh, these patients, MAVA LT, long-term follow-up for patients who completed Maverick HCM or Explore uh, HCM is now currently ongoing. So uh, the conclusion of the uh, uh, slide is uh, shown here, uh, or the presentation is shown here. Uh, Explore HCM trial demonstrated efficacy of MAV counting obstructive HCM primary and all secondary endpoints were met with high statistical uh, significance. Mavacantin demonstrated a clinically important effects on post-exercise LVLT gradients. Nearly 75% patients saw a reduction below guideline defined thresholds for invasive septal reduction therapy and 56 showed complete relief of obstruction. Mavacantin demonstrated marked improvements in NYJ functional class, exercise performance, and key aspects of uh, health status, and were accompanied by reduction in serum and TPRO BMP and troponin I levels. Mavacantin was well tolerated with a safety profile comparable uh, to placebo. And now uh, the paper uh, was uh, simultaneously published in Lancet in the uh, uh, with a talk uh, with uh, Stephen, I found that the, that the uh, <laughs> this uh, from the news and the BMS uh, to acquire uh, myocardia for uh, 1.1 billion in cash. So that concludes uh, my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks, Junior. It's uh, it's a, a fascinating clinical area that we've struggled for a long time uh, to try and have therapeutics, and um, this definitely seems to tick a whole bunch of boxes in terms of the things they looked at. It seemed to benefit. Um, um, would there be anything else you'd like to kind of see? I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, in terms of reduction in hospitalisation, or I guess the long-term studies can look at less needs for septal ablation therapy, less kind of arrhythmia, sudden cardiac death, those types of things? Yeah, I, I think those are the things uh, they're looking at uh, for long-term uh, follow-up uh, 
clinical trial, and the, uh, I think this is a value uh, which compares uh, the septal reduction therapy versus the uh, MAP counting will be a very extremely important one to uh, look at. And the, uh, uh, at the end of the day, maybe we, uh, as an interventional cardiologist, uh, we are seeing less and less work. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, and I, I mean, as you as you said at the end, clearly there's a there's a sense that there's a global market uh, for for the use of you know novel kind of biologics kind of in this space, uh, and uh, one does always have the sense that the the structural approaches to the management here have always been um, the best that we can do. Um, uh, so maybe we we get to advance that. Um, you, you, you touched on the beta blocker finding which yes. is I, I, pretty significant. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, quite significant, but I, I don't know why this uh, happened. I, I think our trial uh, data shows uh, uh, more benefit in patients uh, without use of beta blockers, but I don't know why. Maybe I have to um, guess, um, maybe Carolyn has, has uh, something to say or... Carolyn? No, I, I, I wish I did and wish I had more insight. Um, uh, specifically about the beta blocker issue, I, I, I don't. But um, uh, what I do think about, though, is the you know, small reduction in injection fraction and those patients who kind of dipped under. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it leads into, you know, so is, is, is this the kind of reduced contractility that's too much? that gets enhanced when there's a beta blocker as well. Um, you know, uh, that, that's complete postulation, right? So, so I, I, I don't know if that's the case at all, uh, but I would have liked to see that long-term primarily is, is the ejection fraction. Also because I think, Steve, you, you brought up um, um, even before we kind of went live about um, potential application in HEPTEP. And of course that's, that's, that's the money. Uh, that's the gold pot there. Um, and, and I do think a lot about maybe how many of these uh, super high ejection fraction types of HEFPEF that we see are actually some kind of form first uh, presentations of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I think a lot of work needs to be done there. Um, but but it, it does matter too that if we're going to just um, make the contractile apparatus less um, less effective, um, really need to understand the long term whether or not we're going to end up with HEPREF. Uh, I, <laughs> I, yeah, look, I agree. And I think that, you know, the, the comment about HEFPEF is, is really important. I, I, I kind of, as I've watched the small number of HEFPEF studies kind of play out so far and the results perhaps be a little disappointing, um, can't help but think that HEFPEF is going to be probably an amalgam of a whole range of different processes. And, and so it, it's probably not going to be a one size fits all kind of approach. I mean, you nicely laid out the argument for multiple classes of drugs really working in a lot of people with HEFREF and, and maybe at that point of the pathology there is a little bit more homogeneity in terms of what we're treating. But uh, the idea that we would have a number of therapeutics kind of in the HEFPEF space, I, I guess, is, 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 is tantalising. I, I guess, Junya, I, that was a question I had for you was, I, I guess, implications beyond HCM and, and maybe if, if you'd like to comment, and not only just about HEFPEF, but yeah. what are the implications for hypertensive yeah. heart disease? What are the implications? <laughs> for yes. a aortic stenotic patient who doesn't need um, a percutaneous valve, uh, um, you know, are, are there implications for these types of therapies beyond kind of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Yeah, that, that's, an, that's an important question. And as Caroline said, uh, the uh, half path will be a, a huge uh, Potential. I, I think this is a potential for uh, half PEF uh, patients, and that's. The, maybe I, I think that's the biggest uh, issue or question. And there's no data uh, about the detailed echocardiography uh, from this trial. So I, I'll be allowed, I'd love to see uh, those changes in the uh, echocardiographic uh, uh, parameters. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, well, thank you, Junya, uh, for that. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot more discussion about the, the, these types of therapeutics in meetings like this for a long time to come. So thank you for kind of introducing the thank topic you. to us today. Um, the final uh, presentation today is from uh, Dan Scherer from uh, Adelaide, Australia. Dan is a cardiologist and imaging fellow at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Uh, he is a, a doctoral research fellow at the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute. Uh, and um, Dan is going to uh, pivot our discussion away from kidneys and hearts uh, more to uh, blood vessels and inflammation and, and, and the kind of really interesting kind of story of repurposing a culture scene to be a cardiovascular drug and share with us the results of the Ladoco 2 trial. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, thank you, Slim. Uh, so I'll be talking about the Ladoco 2 trial, uh, which was presented in um, the hotline presentation, the recent virtual ESC, uh, was also simultaneously published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so as Steve mentioned, obviously, we know atherosclerosis is an inflammatory mediated disease that's uh, driven by deposition of LDL within the arterial wall. Um, now, the mainstay of our secondary prevention therapeutic treatments have been focused on lowering of LDL level um, up until basically the last five years where we've progressed to actually directly trying to target the inflammation. Um, I'll just go through a bit of a background of uh, these main studies over the last five years. So I guess it started um, with Paul Ridker and, um, and Kantos. So canakinumab uh, monoclonal antibody targeted at interleukin-1 beta, um, where a, a large 10,000 patient study looking at secondary prevention in patients with high sensitivity CRP greater than two. Uh, over a four year follow up, they're able to show a 15% reduction in the composite MACE. Um, now there was no independent either cardiovascular or non-cardiovascular mortality benefit there. Um, Kantos, uh, I guess, canakinumab, the story was probably impaired a bit by the fact that it's also an orphan drug that uh, has a high cost use in the United States, um, costing about $200,000 a year. So um, unfortunately, that failed to get an indication by the FDA. And so they haven't gone forward with cardiovascular disease for canakinumab. Um, almost sort of run in parallel to that was the CERT trial. Um, where we, they looked at low-dose methotrexate, uh, which targets the interleukin-6 signaling pathway. Um, once again, looking at a, a high-risk secondary prevention cardiovascular disease patient cohort. Um, and after a, a median of, of just over two years, this was stopped due to futility. Uh, most recently, we've seen the Colquitt trial that the the data was presented from last year. So uh, this looked at culture scene, which has multiple effects. Uh, firstly, inhibiting the NLRP3 inflammasome, which reduces both interleukin-1 beta as well as interleukin-18, um, and also has antitubulin effects on uh, neutrophils. Um, with just under 5,000 subjects that had had recent acute coronary syndromes with a 23 month follow-up, they're able to show a 23% reduction in MACE that was driven by predominantly by reduction in ischemic stroke and revascularization for unstable angina. Um, of note, that also didn't show an independent cardiovascular mortality benefit. So the first Ladoco trial um, was an investigator led study uh, run out of Western Australia, here in Australia. Uh, it was a low dose culture scene, 0.5 milligrams. Um, it was run with a, a probe trial design, so it didn't have uh, a placebo control. Um, they did have their outcomes adjudicated by a blinded outcome uh, reviewer. Um, it was uh, essentially a small sort of proof of concept study with uh, 532 patients, um, a stable secondary prevention cohort. Uh, and they showed in, in Ladoco that there was a reduction in the composite MACE endpoint driven predominantly by acute coronary syndrome reduction of 67%. Um, now obviously being a, a non-placebo controlled trial, there, there was some questions of the uh, the extent of the result that they uh, they achieved and showed. And also um, there was a, an 11% cessation rate due to adverse events from culture saying um, and patients that 
were withdrawn in the first month were actually replaced. So this has led forward to the same group presenting Lodoco to uh, ESC, the objective being to determine whether low-dose colchicine uh, was able to prevent cardiovascular events in patients with stable chronic coronary disease. Uh, once again, uh, this is an investigator initiated and led study, uh, this time double blind and placebo controlled, uh, began in Australia in mid 2014 and was expanded to the Netherlands in late 2016, um, where they ended up recruiting approximately two thirds of the cohort from the Netherlands, which I'll get back to a bit later on. As per the protocol, patients aged 35 to 82 years with proven coronary disease had to be clinically stable for at least six months. Um, people with advanced renal disease, heart failure or valvular disease were excluded. Now, the design of the trial, given the issues with colchicine tolerability, um, all subjects were that agreed to be involved initially had a 30-day open label run-in of colchicine. Um, and those that were able to tolerate this and were happy to continue on in the trial were then randomised to either colchicine or placebo. Um, so we have a, a low-dose colchicine study with no loading dose. It's now placebo controlled and double-blinded. Um, it's in a stable secondary prevention cohort and a primary composite endpoint of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke and ischemia driven coronary revascularization. Uh, they initially enrolled just over 6,500 people and just under 9% of those that were enrolled were unable to tolerate colchicine, leaving just over 5,500 patients to be randomised. Um, and they did a remarkable job with uh, the follow-up, as you can see from the numbers there. Uh, as expected with the, uh, the issues of tolerability, tolerability uh, with the culture scene, this was predominantly uh, due to gastrointestinal side effects. Uh, you can see from the demographics, this was uh, run in a population of uh, average age of 66. It was overwhelmingly male um, patients, which is um, a bit surprising given what we see with, um, with chronic coronary disease, but uh, I guess it's, it's not uncommon from clinical trials. Um, the uh, comorbidities uh, were, were similar between both groups. Uh, and I guess it's important to highlight that uh, this certainly wasn't a group of people that uh, had just had prior revascularization uh, for electively for uh, progressive coronary disease. Uh, over 80% of, of people had had prior, uh, prior acute coronary syndromes. And from the point of view of this being a stable cohort, two thirds of these um, had had their acute coronary syndrome at least two years prior. Uh, medication use, I guess, is as, as expected. Um, patients were on either single antiplatelet therapy or dual antiplatelet therapy. And I guess with the new direct oral anticoagulants that we're seeing with concomitant atrial fibrillation, there was about 10% of both groups that were on an anticoagulant. Uh, there was high use of statin therapy, which is similar to what we've seen in the recent PCSK9 inhibitor trials. Um, and between the groups, there was no significant difference between RAS beta blocker or calcium channel blockers. So the primary endpoint, um, they were able to show that patients that were randomized to culture scene uh, had a 31% reduction in the combined primary endpoint. Um, this was uh, with an event rate in the placebo arm of the group that was approximately 3% per year. Uh, once again, similar to what we see in the recent uh, outcome trials in PCSK9 inhibitor trials. Um, of note, the, uh, the key secondary endpoint, um, which was a MACE endpoint that removed the revascularization endpoint. So I guess a, a harder endpoint still had a significant finding with a 28% reduction in cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction or ischemic stroke in the culture sync group. Uh, they had ranked secondary endpoints, um, the, the majority of which were uh, um, composite endpoints, uh, although they're able to show independently um, that ischemia driven revascularization and myocardial infarction um, from a secondary analysis were, were also significantly lower with culture. Same. 
the adverse events, I guess, from what we know of culture scene and the potential risks, certainly the things that were concerning with uh, myelosuppression or potentially potential myotoxic effects uh, before the trial um, didn't bear out. There was no significant difference between neutropenia and myotoxic effects. Um, while the, the numbers of non-cardiovascular death were low, um, I guess it's important to note that there did appear to be um, a signal towards increased non-cardiovascular death in the culture scene group. This uh, does cross hazard ratio of one, so it, uh, it didn't reach statistical significance. So I guess in, um, in discussion of, of the trial, uh, uh, I think this is an investigator-led study, uh, a repurposing of a, of a cheap and, and, and freely available off-patent medication. And um, I think the, uh, the investigator should be uh, congratulated on, on doing this. Um, I think they've, uh, they've shown efficacy in reduction of events in a, a chronic coronary artery disease cohort. Um, and I guess I've also shown, shown that in culture scene, we have concerns about the potential of, uh, of, of whether people are going to be able to tolerate this long term. And certainly it looks like, similar to some of the other trials, that about 10% of patients are unable to tolerate this predominantly due to GI upset. Um, but that once those patients uh, found early on, um, there wasn't a significant difference between the dropout between the culture scene and placebo arm moving forward over um, the, the follow-up period for some patients up to five years. Uh, there are a couple of things um, for further discussion though about this trial. Uh, I guess one of the limitations was that uh, they didn't really report or take baseline risk factor control information. Uh, they didn't have uh, the control of blood pressure for comparison in either arm, the control of, of lipids in either arm, um, and also didn't actually check inflammatory markers, for instance, high sensitivity CRP to be able to look at the comparison between arms. Uh, it would have been nice to potentially add that in. Um, and the, the two other concerns uh, about the trial are the fact that there were regional differences um, and also the, the signal of potential non-cardiovascular mortality. I'll discuss both of these issues a bit further now. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this was initially led from Western Australia and then expanded to include the Netherlands. Um, the Netherlands ended up being the recruiting site for about two thirds of the subjects for the patients for the trial. Um, and I'll just bring to your attention the significant regional difference that we saw with um, the Netherlands uh, recruiting almost 3,600 patients. The, uh, the difference in the primary endpoint events between the two groups was, was only eight. Um, whereas the, the positive aspect of the trial was overwhelmingly um, driven by the redu reduction in, in events in the culture scene group uh, from patients from Australia. Um, now, the, uh, the authors, I guess, at this stage have, have been unable to explain exactly what the cause of that is. Um, and uh, I'm not, not sure whether I can add much further to it today. And certainly looking at the, the regional differences between the groups, um, there were certainly higher percentages of smokers in the Netherlands and higher rates of prior coronary revascularization. Um, so there was potentially a, a slightly higher risk cohort from the Netherlands. Um, other than this, the only uh, differences were in azetamide use and, and, and potentially beta blocker use. Um, I guess the concern in this is whether the findings of, these, of, the, of this trial is, is, is able to be generalised for uh, all populations, given what we've seen with the large amount of patients that were recruited from the Netherlands. Um, and the second issue, um, since the, uh, the, the presentation at ESC, um, you know, th there have been different views upon this as to, you know, it, it's certainly a, a trend towards an increase in non-cardiovascular death. Um, it hasn't reached statistical significance, um, but I guess the, the question that we're left with is, is it concerning enough to want to wait and see some further evidence or um, 
is this now uh, a cheap medication that we should be starting all of our patients on um, that have stable chronic coronary artery disease? Um, I think that uh, there are other trials that are ongoing and I know that uh, um, another group from Australia have had a publication um, in circulation put up prior to in print um, looking at the Australian COPS study. Um, of note, this is slightly different to uh, Ladoco 2. Um, it had basically a loading dose period of a month um, where patients actually had um, 500 micrograms twice a day for the first month prior to going on to the low dose daily dose um, and had a, a, a slightly different um, cohort that uh, they included that were, were probably uh, slightly higher risk. Um, but the uh, the finding of significance there was that the, they showed quite significant increase with the higher dose in um, in the rate of uh, of death in the culture scene arm. Um, so I, I think that there's probably more to come out of uh, the story of, of culture scene before we're putting all of our patients on this. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. That's uh, fantastic. Um, let, let, let me kind of tease out on a couple of the points that you, you, you kind of you talk to towards the end. Um, so I guess the first is the, the culture scene clinical trial space has just become very busy. Yeah. Um, and But it's become very busy with kind of modest size trials. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I can't help but reflect, you've, you've shared with us, Ladoco ones, 500 odd patients. Uh, it's a nice kind of conceptual study, open label administration. Um, we've, we've now seen Colcott, little over 3000 patients show a benefit, but it looked like the benefit was almost exclusively in stroke. Um, you shared with us Ladoco two, which is about 5,000 patients. We see a benefit um, where the benefit looks like it's across more than just stroke. Um, there seems to be a consistency across the individual components, um, but you do share with us the, the kind of the non-CV death kind of signal. We see the COP study of 800 patients um, that shows no benefit, perhaps a signal to benefit if in the patients treated for longer, but again, you see this eight versus one deaths. Um, I can't help but think that we've got lots of little studies, but we don't have that one big definitive study. And now we're kind of left with a whole bunch of kind of lingering questions, largely around more safety elements. Um, do we need another 3,000 patient study or do we need a 13,000 patient study to really kind of reconcile all of this? Yeah, I, I think that um, certainly the issue now, uh, uh, you're quite right, there are a number of differing findings. The larger studies um, appear to show a benefit. Um, I think safety really is is the concern of people currently, and I think a larger trial is, is probably required to be able to show that there isn't um, a, a concern about that non-cardiovascular death signal. Yeah. Um, you talked about the regional differences and, you know, the, 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 t the table and the supplement shows that almost everything's different. Um, I, I guess the one thing that's not in the table, uh, which I think is also a really important point, is that by virtue of the study design, the, the Australian patients had simply been in the study longer. And so while they were only a third of the patients, they were the ones that enrolled fairly early in the study and then it was expanded. Uh, to more enrolment overseas, and so are we. Are we again looking at what we often see in these kind of atherosclerosis type trials? Uh, you need to treat patients for long enough to see a benefit, or do we really kind of aren't really sure at all what's going on there, given all the differences? Uh, look, I, I guess the answer is I, I don't know. I can't tell you for sure. I think one of the things to speak towards that is that we do see the curves tend to diverge quite early on. Um, that there was a clear difference by the 12 month period of treatment. Um, so uh, that would potentially, you know, direct a bit away from the fact that it was just that the, the patients in the Netherlands hadn't been able to be on trial for as long a period. 
Um, certainly, as you said, as we see in atherosclerosis trials, and as you looked at those curves, they continued to diverge over time and certainly appeared to be continuing to do so up to five years. Um, so I think it's possible, but I, I think I would have liked to see a bit more of a response in the the, the patients from the Netherlands, given that we were seeing that separation as early as 12 months. Yeah. And then I guess the final question, um, and you've talked about, we don't really know a lot about LDL and blood pressure coming in. You showed some differences in terms of concomitant therapies and things between the Netherlands and Australia. Um, so I guess the question is putting your kind of clinician's hat on now. Do you, do you, do you have... Are you convinced enough to use this? Is it going to be in everybody? Is it going to only be in some people? And who would you use it kind of in today? Yeah, look, I, I, I personally, I, I think that it's probably, for me, it's not on everyone um, at this stage, um, given the, um, certainly given the safety signal. Um, I think that, um, and, and we've already, we're already seeing um, some people that are dealing with people with quite difficult to manage lipid issues that um, have, you know, significant residual risk patients that have really high LP little a levels, potentially um, patients that have really high, high sensitivity CRP levels, despite um, maximal dose statin therapy. Um, I think that there's potential that um, I, I might be interested in, in, in trialing it in some of those groups. Um, but I think with the safety signal, certainly, I don't think that um, next week I'm going to be turning around and putting everyone that I see in clinic on this. And I think some of the ongoing studies are, are looking at different ways to get patients into the study, i.e. raised inflammatory markers and things like that. And maybe that, that's, that gives us more information. So, um, on that note, thank you, Dan. Um, I'm mindful that we've been going for 90 minutes and it's my turn now to uh, draw this session to a close. Uh, I thank everybody um, for joining us today. This has been an extraordinary session and I, I can't help but think the last few ESC have been some of the best scientific meetings that we've had in a generation and you just remember them for the... Um, the amazing results and we'll remember them for a long time because they were really truly influenced the way that we manage our patients. And I think that we've seen a really fantastic reflection today on how we might improve renal outcomes for high risk patients, um, the ongoing uh, challenges um, of managing heart failure and, and um, heart muscle disease in a range of its different kind of uh, presentations and, and then finally, this kind of really tantalising concept of the inflammatory nature of vascular disease. Not only do we have the opportunity to repurpose old drugs, but I think it opens the door for um, um, the development of a whole range of new therapies as well. So I'd like to thank my colleagues. Um, if I'm going to give up an hour and a half on a Saturday afternoon, um, I, I, it's uh, been a great group to do that with. And thank you each for... Uh, sharing your um, insights today and thank everybody for joining us and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.